Chapter 65 Sansa The throne room was a sea of jewels, furs, and bright fabrics. Lords and ladies filled the back of the hall and stood beneath the high windows, jostling like fishwives on a dock. The denizens of Joffrey's court had striven to outdo each other today. Jalabar Zo was all in feathers, a plumage so fantastic and extravagant that he seemed like to take flight. The High Septon's crystal crown fired rainbows through the air every time he moved his head. At the council table, Queen Cersei shimmered in a cloth of gold gown slashed in burgundy velvet, while beside her Varys fussed and simpered in a lilac brocade. Moonboy and Sir Dantos wore new suits of motley, clean as a spring morning. Even Lady Tanda and her daughters looked pretty in matching gowns of turquoise silk and vair and Lord Giles was coughing into a square of scarlet silk trimmed with golden lace. King Joffrey sat above them all, amongst the blades and barbs of the Iron Throne. He was in crimson samite, his black mantle studded with rubies, and on his head he wore his heavy golden crown. Squirming through a press of knights, squires, and rich townsfolk, Sansa reached the front of the gallery just as a blast of trumpets announced the entry of Lord Tywin Lannister. He rode his war horse down the length of the hall and dismounted before the Iron Throne. Sansa had never seen such armor, all burnished red steel, inlaid with golden scrollwork and ornamentation. His rondels were sunbursts, the roaring lion that crowned his helm had ruby eyes, and a lioness on each shoulder fastened a cloth of gold cloak so long and heavy that it draped the hind quarters of his charger. Even the horse's armor was gilded and his bardings were shimmering crimson silk and blazoned with the Lion of Lannister. The Lord of Casterly Rock made such an impressive figure that it was a shock when his destrier dropped a load of dung right at the base of the throne. Joffrey had to step gingerly around it as he descended to embrace his grandfather and proclaim him savior of the city. Sansa covered her mouth to hide a nervous smile. Joff made a show of asking his grandfather to assume governance of the realm, and Lord Tywin Lannister solemnly accepted the responsibility, "'Until your grace does come of age.' Then Squires removed his armor, and Joff fastened the hand's chain of office around his neck. Lord Tywin took a seat at the council table beside the queen. After the destrier was let off and his homage removed, Cersei nodded for the ceremonies to continue. A fanfare of brazen trumpets greeted each of the heroes as he stepped between the great oaken doors. Heralds cried his name and deeds for all to hear, and the noble knights and highborn ladies cheered as lustily as cutthroats at a cockfight. Pride of place was given to Mace Tyrell, the Lord of Highgarden, a once powerful man gone to fat yet still handsome. His sons followed him in, Sir Loras and his older brother Sir Garland the Gallant, the three dressed alike, in green velvet trimmed with sable. The king descended the throne once more to greet them, a great honor. He fastened about the throat of each a chain of roses wrought in soft yellow gold, from which hung a golden disc with the Lion of Lannister picked out in rubies. The roses support the lion, as the might of Highgarden supports the realm, proclaimed Joffrey. If there is any boon you would ask of me, ask it and it shall be yours. And now it comes, thought Sansa. Your grace, said Sir Loras, I beg the honor of serving in your king's guard to defend you against your enemies. Joffrey drew the knight of flowers to his feet and kissed him on his cheek. Done, brother. Lord Tyrell bowed his head. There's no greater pleasure than to serve the king's grace. If I was deemed worthy to join your royal council, you would find none more loyal or true. Joff put a hand on Lord Tyrell's shoulder and kissed him when he stood. Your wish is granted. Sir Garland Tyrell, five years senior to Sir Loras, was a taller, bearded version of his more famous younger brother. He was thicker about the chest and broader at the shoulders, and though his face was comely enough, he lacked Sir Loras's startling beauty. Your grace, Garland said when the king approached him, I have a maiden sister, Marjorie, the delight of our house. She was to wed Renly Baratheon, as you know. But Lord Renly went to war before the marriage could be consummated, so she remains innocent. Marjorie has heard tales of your wisdom, courage, and chivalry, and has come to love you from afar. 
I beseech you to send for her, to take her hand in marriage, and to wed your house to mine for all time. King Joffrey made a show of looking surprised. Sir Garland, your sister's beauty is famed throughout the Seven Kingdoms, but I am promised to another. A king must keep his word. Queen Cersei got to her feet in a rustle of skirts. Your Grace, in the judgment of your small council, it would be neither proper nor wise for you to wed the daughter of a man beheaded for treason, a girl whose brother is in open rebellion against the throne even now. Sire, your counselors beg you, for the good of your realm, set Sansa Stark aside. The Lady Marjorie will make you a far more suitable queen. Like a pack of trained dogs, the lords and ladies in the hall began to shout their pleasure. Marjorie, they called. Give us Marjorie! And no traitor queens! Tyrell! Tyrell! Joffrey raised a hand. I would like to heed the wishes of my people, mother, but I took a holy vow. The High Septon stepped forward. Your Grace, the gods hold betrothal solemn, but your father, King Robert of Blessed Memory, made this pact before the stocks of Winterfell had revealed their falseness. Their crimes against the realm have freed you from any promise you might have made. So far as the faith is concerned, there is no valid marriage contract twixt you and Sansa Stark. A tumult of cheering filled the room amid cries of, Marjorie! Marjorie! Sansa leaned forward, her hands tight around the gallery's wooden rail. She knew what came next, but she was still frightened of what Joffrey might say. Afraid that he would refuse to release her even now when his whole kingdom depended on it. She felt as though she were back again on the marble steps outside the great sept of Baelor, waiting for her prince to grant her father mercy, and instead of hearing him command ill in pain to strike off his head. Please, she prayed fervently, make him say it, make him say it. Lord Tywin was looking at his grandson. Joff gave him a sullen glance, shifted his feet and helped Sir Garland Tyrell to rise. The gods are good. I am free to heed my heart. I will wed your sweet sister, and gladly, sir. He kissed Sir Garland on a bearded cheek as the cheers rose all around them. Sansa felt curiously lightheaded. I am free. She could feel eyes upon her. I must not smile, she reminded herself. The queen had warned her, no matter what she felt inside. The face she showed the world must look distraught. I will not have my son humiliated, Cersei said. Do you hear me? Yes, but if I'm not to be queen, what will become of me? That will need to be determined. For the moment, you shall remain here at court as our ward. I want to go home. The queen was irritated by that. You should have learned by now. None of us get the things we want. I have, though, Sansa thought. I'm free of Joffrey. I will not have to kiss him, nor give him my maidenhood, nor bear him children. Let Marjorie Tyrell have all that. Poor girl. By the time the outburst died down, the Lord of Highgarden had been seated at the council table, and his sons had joined the other knights and lordlings beneath the windows. Sansa tried to look forlorn and abandoned as other heroes of the Battle of the Blackwater were summoned forth to receive their rewards. Paxter Redwine, Lord of the Arbor, marched down the length of the hall flanked by his twin sons, Horror and Slobber, the former limping from a wound taken in the battle. After them followed Lord Mathis Rowan in a snowy doublet, with a great tree worked upon the breast in gold thread. Lord Randall Tarley, lean and balding, a great sword across his back in a jeweled scabbard. Sir Kevon Lannister, a thick-set balding man with a close-trimmed beard. Sir Adam Marbrand, coppery hair streaming to his shoulders. The great western lords Lydon, Craycall, and Brax. Next came four of lesser birth, who had distinguished themselves in the fighting. The one-eyed knight, Sir Philip Foote, who had slain Lord Bryce Caron in single combat. The free rider, Lothor Broon who'd cut his way through half a dozen, half a hundred Fossaway men-at-arms to capture Sir John of the Green Apple and kill Sir Brian and Sir Edwid of the Red, thereby winning himself the name Lothor Apple Eater. Willet, a grizzled man-at-arms in the service of Sir Harris Swift, who pulled his master from beneath his dying horse and defended him against a dozen attackers. 
and a downy-cheeked squire named Josman Peckledon, who had killed two knights, wounded a third, and captured two more, though he could not have been more than fourteen. Willet was borne in on a litter, so grievous were his wounds. Sir Kevon had taken a seat beside his brother, Lord Tywin. When the heralds had finished telling of each hero's deeds, he rose. It is his grace's wish that these good men be rewarded for their valour. By his decree, Sir Philip shall henceforth be Lord Philip of House Foot, and to him shall go all the lands, rights, and incomes of House Caron. Lothor Brune to be raised to the estate of knighthood, and granted land and keep in the riverlands at war's end. To Josman Peckledon, a sword and suit of plate, his choice of any war horse in the royal stables, and knighthood as soon as he shall come of age. And lastly, for Goodman Willet, a spear with a silver-handed haft, a hauberk of new-forged ring-mail, and a full helm with visor. Further, the goodman's son shall be taken into the service of House Lannister at Casterly Rock, the elder as a squire and the younger as a page, with the chance to advance to knighthood if they serve loyally and well. To all this the king's hand and the small council consent. The captains of the king's warships, Wild Wind, Prince Aemon, and River Arrow, were honored next, along with some under-officers from God's Grace, Lance, Lady of Silk, and Ramshead. As near as Sansa could tell, their chief accomplishment had been surviving the battle on the river, a feat that few enough could boast. Helene the Pyromancer and the Masters of the Alchemist Guild received the king's thanks as well, and Helene was raised to the style of Lord though Sansa noted that neither lands nor castle accompanied the title, which made the alchemist no more a true lord than Varys was. A more significant lordship by far was granted to Sir Lancel Lannister. Joffrey awarded him the lands, castle, and rights to of House Derry, whose last child lord had perished during the fighting in the Riverlands, leaving no true-born heirs or lawful Derry blood, but only a bastard cousin. Sir Lancel did not appear to accept the title. The talk was his wound might cost his arm or even his life. The imp was said to be dying as well, from a terrible cut to the head. When the herald called, Lord Peter Baelish, he came forth dressed all in shades of rose and plum, his cloak patterned with mockingbirds. She could see him smiling as he knelt before the Iron Throne. He looked so pleased. Sansa had not heard of Littlefinger doing anything especially heroic during the battle, but it seemed he was to be rewarded all the same. Sir Kevon got back to his feet. It is the wish of the King's Grace that his loyal counselor, Peter Baelish, be rewarded for faithful service to crown and realm. Be it known that Lord Baelish is granted the castle of Harrenhal with all its attendant lands and income there to make his seat and rule henceforth as Lord Paramount of the Trident. Peter Baelish and his sons and grandsons shall hold and enjoy these honors until the end of time, and all the lords of the Trident shall do him homage as their rightful liege. The king's hand and the small council consent. On his knees, Littlefinger raised his eyes to King Joffrey. I thank you humbly, your grace. I suppose this means I'll need to see about getting some sons and grandsons. Joffrey laughed, and the court with him. Lord Paramount of the Trident, Sansa thought, and Lord of Harrenhal as well. She did not understand why that should make him so happy. The honors were as empty as the title granted to Helene the Pyromancer. Harrenhal was cursed, everybody knew that, and the Lannisters did not even hold it at present. Besides, the lords of the Trident were sworn to River Run and House Tully, and to the king in the north. They would never accept Littlefinger as their liege. Unless they are made to. Unless my brother and my uncle and my grandfather are all cast down and killed. The thought made Sansa anxious, but she told herself she was being silly. Rob has beaten them every time. He'll beat Lord Baelish too if he must. More than six hundred new knights were made that day. They had held their vigil in the Great Sept of Baelor all through the night and crossed the city barefoot that morning to prove their humble hearts. Now they came forward dressed in shifts of undyed wool to receive their knighthoods from the Kingsguard. It took a long time, since only three of the Brothers of the White Sword were on hand to dub them. Mandon Moore had perished in the battle. The Hound had vanished, 
Eris Oakhart was in Dorne with Princess Marcella, and Jaime Lannister was Rob's captive. So the Kingsguard had been reduced to Balin Swan, Marin Trant, and Osmond Kettleback. Once knighted, each man rose, buckled on his sword belt, and stood beneath the windows. Some had bloody feet from their walk through the city. But they stood tall and proud all the same, it seemed to Sansa. By the time all the new knights had been given their sirs, the hall was growing restive, and none more so than Joffrey. Some of those in the gallery had begun to quietly slip away, but the notables on the floor were trapped, unable to depart without the king's leave. Judging by the way he was fidgeting atop the Iron Throne, Joff would willingly have granted it, but the day's work was far from done, for now the coin was turned over, and the captives were ushered in. There were great lords and noble knights in that company, too. Sour old, old Lord Keltigar, the Red Crab, Sir Bonifer the Good, Lord Estermont, more ancient even than Keltigar, Lord Varner, who hobbled the length of the hall on a shattered knee but would accept no help, Sir Mark Mullendore, grey-faced, his left arm gone to the elbow, fierce Red Ronnet of Griffin Roost, Sir Dermot of the Rainwood, Lord Willem and his sons Josua and Elias, Sir John Fossaway, Sir Tymon the Scrapesword, Orain the Bastard of Driftmark, Lord Stademan, called Penny Lover, hundreds of others. Those who would change their allegiance during the battle needed only to swear fealty to Joffrey, but the ones who had fought for Stannis until the bitter end were compelled to speak. Their words decided their fate. If they begged forgiveness for their treasons and promised to serve loyally henceforth, Joffrey welcomed them back into the king's peace and restored them to all their lands and rights. A handful remained defiant, however. Do not imagine this is done, boy, warned one, the bastard son of some florent or other. The Lord of Light protects King Stannis now and always. All your swords and all your scheming shall not save you when his hour comes. Your hour is come right now. Joffrey beckoned to Sir Ilan Payne to take the man out and strike his head off. But no sooner had that one been dragged away than a knight of solemn mien with a fiery heart on his surcoat shouted out, Stannis is the true king! A monster sits the Iron Throne! An abomination born of incest! Be silent! Sir Kevin Lannister bellowed. The knight raised his voice instead. Joffrey is the black worm eating the heart of the realm! Darkness was his father, and death his mother. Destroy him before he corrupts you all. Destroy them all. Queen Whore and King Worm, vile dwarf and whispering spider, the false flowers, save yourselves. One of the gold cloaks knocked the man off his feet, but he continued to shout. The scouring fire will come. King Stannis will return. Joffrey lurched to his feet. I'm king! Kill him! Kill him now! I command it! He chopped down with his hand, a furious, angry gesture, and screeched in pain when his arm brushed against one of the sharp metal fangs that surrounded him. The bright crimson samite of his sleeve turned a darker shade of red as his blood soaked through it. Mother! He wailed. With every eye on the king, somehow the man on the floor wrested a spear away from one of the gold cloaks and used it to push himself back to his feet. The throne denies him, he cried. He is no king! Cersei was running toward the throne, but Lord Tywin remained still as stone. He had only to raise a finger, and Sir Marin Trant moved forward with drawn sword. The end was quick and brutal. The gold cloak seized the knight by the arms. No king! he cried again as Sir Marin drove the point of his long sword through his chest. Joff fell into his mother's arms. Three maesters came hurrying forward to bundle him out through the king's door. Then everyone began talking at once. When the gold cloaks dragged off the dead man, he left a trail of bright blood across the stone floor. Lord Baelish stroked his beard while Varys whispered in his ear. Will they dismiss us now? Sansa wondered. A score of captives still waited. Though whether to pledge fealty or shout curses, who could say? Lord Tywin rose to his feet. We continue, he said in a clear, strong voice that silenced the murmurs. 
Those who wish to ask pardon for their treasons may do so. We will have no more follies. He moved to the Iron Throne and there seated himself on a step, a mere three feet off the floor. The light outside the windows was fading by the time the session drew to a close. Sansa felt limp with exhaustion as she made her way down from the gallery. She wondered how badly Joffrey had cut himself. They say the Iron Throne can be perilous cruel to those who were not meant to sit it. Back in the safety of her own chambers, she hugged a pillow to her face to muffle a squeal of joy. Oh, gods be good, he did it! He put me aside in front of everyone! When a serving girl brought her supper, she almost kissed her. There was hot bread and fresh churned butter, a thick beef soup, capons and carrots, and peaches and honey. Even the food tastes sweeter, she thought. <clears throat> Come dark, she slipped into a cloak and left for the godswood. Sir Osmond Kettleback was guarding the drawbridge in his white armor. Sansa tried her best to sound miserable as she bid him a good evening. From the way he leered at her, she was not sure she had been wholly convincing. Dantos was waiting in the leafy moonlight. Why so sad face? Sansa asked him gaily. You were there, you heard. Joff put me aside. He's done with me, he's... He took her hand. Oh, Jonquil, my poor Jonquil. You do not understand. Done with you? They've scarcely begun. Her heart sank. What do you mean? The queen will never let you go, never. You're too valuable a hostage. And Joffrey, sweetling, he is still king. If he wants you in his bed, he will have you. Only now it will be bastards he plants in your womb instead of true-born sons. No, Sansa said, shocked. He let me go, he... Sir Dantos planted a slobbery kiss on her ear. Be brave. I swore to see you home, and now I can. The day has been chosen. When? Sansa asked. When will we go? The night of Joffrey's wedding. After the feast. All the necessary arrangements have been made. The Red Keep will be full of strangers. Half the court will be drunk, and the other half will be helping Joffrey bed his bride. For a little while, you will be forgotten, and the confusion will be our friend. The wedding won't be for a moon's turn yet. Marjorie Tyrell is at Highgarden. They've only now sent for her. You've waited so long. Be patient a while longer. Here, I have something for you. Sir Dantos fumbled in his pouch and drew out a silvery spider web, dangling it between his thick fingers. It was a hairnet of fine spun silver, the strands so thin and delicate the net seemed to weigh no more than a breath of air when Sansa took it in her fingers. Small gems were set wherever the two strands crossed, so dark they drank the moonlight. What stones are these? Black amethysts from a shy, the rarest kind. A deep, true purple by daylight. It's very lovely, Sansa said, thinking, It is a ship I need, not a net for my hair. Lovelier than you know, sweet child. It's magic, you see. It's justice, you hold. It's vengeance for your father. Dantos leaned close and kissed her again. It's home! <laughs>